mentioned that it's Palm Sunday, and uh, you know, on Palm Sunday, it's hard to preach anything else other than the literal story of Palm Sunday. You know, this is such an important week in our faith. If you're not really familiar with the Bible, the four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, about a third of that content is about the last week of Jesus' life. So Jesus lived for 33 years, and about a third of what we know of his life is from one single a week. And this today marks the entry into that week. And so I think it's very important. And I think it's important how you go into a season. Maybe that's a word for somebody this morning. Uh, we always want to talk about how you leave a season, but it's also very important how you enter into something. And so Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 28, we read the story of Jesus's triumphant entry. Come on. He's, how many know Jesus is the triumphant King? Come on. He's already conquered death, hell, and the grave. I know Easter's next week, but he's still not on that cross anymore. He's out of the grave. He's out of the tomb. So Luke chapter 19, verse 28 says, after telling this story, Jesus went on towards Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into the village over there, he told them. And as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks why you are untying that colt, just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, aka stealing it, <clears throat> I mean borrowing for the Lord, the owner asked, which is very, you know, a very common question, hey, <laughs> why are you untying that colt? <laughs> And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus, threw their garments over it and let him, uh, for him to ride on it. And as they rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started to go down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Just a side note, Jesus did a lot of miracles in this area. This is where he probably had the highest concentration of his followers was in Bethany. Maybe you've heard the story about Lazarus being raised from the dead. This was in Bethany. So people know about Jesus in Bethany. They know about the wonderful miracles they had seen. And they said, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. We just sang this very similar to this verse. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst out into cheers. Come on, how many of you know Jesus is going to be praised? Jesus is going to be worshiped. Let's pray together, bless God's word. Dear Lord, I thank you that you are in this room. I pray that you would anoint me, that it would not be my words, but it would be your words. And Lord, I pray that you would open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive. Let your will be done today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Well, here's my, my title, my subject for today. Here comes the king. Here comes the king. The king. Now I want you to turn to a neighbor. I'm one of those guys, just by the way, I'm one of those participation guys. So turn to your neighbor and say, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Come on, turn to two or three people. I know introverts, you're hating me right now, but just go with it. Just go with it. He's coming. He's coming. But now I want you to turn back to those same people who just talked to you. And I want you to say, who's, who's coming? <laughs> just kind of or kind of put a little attitude on it. I know we're in the woodlands, but we're, we're pretty close to Houston, so put a little Houston on it, like, who, who's coming? Who's coming? Who's coming? The king's coming, but what, but what, what do you mean the king's coming? Because, because no king I know of <laughs> rides on a donkey. No, no, no king I know of comes in with some, some scraggly, raggeded fishermen with their sandals, and they're all dusty, and they're walking. That, that's not how a king enters into a kingdom. Who, who, who's coming? You said the king's coming. When I think of king, I think of gold. I think of chariots. I, 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 think, uh, I think of someone carrying him. I, I think of jewelry. I, I don't think of a donkey. Come on, let's be honest. It, it doesn't look like a king. He was riding a donkey, so can we be real? It probably didn't smell like a king. Uh, it, it didn't look like a king was coming to town. 
So the crowd of people, I can imagine you had a few different responses. You, you did have the followers of Jesus who had seen the miracles, they'd seen him in action. And so those were like the 915 service type of people. Those were the real saved people. Come on, if you're in here today, you're the real saved people. Those are the people like, Jesus is coming, come on, Jesus, King Jesus. They're the people that are in worship. This, these are the people that I love to be around. These are the people that are encouraging. They always got a scripture, like even when you don't want a scripture, they're going to hit you back with the scripture. That's how my, my mother-in-law is. I think she's going to be in the second service. It's like, even when I just want a pity party, she's going to hit me with a scripture. And I'm like, you got to do, I just want to, I just want to complain a little bit. Come on, come on. So you had the people that were, were cheering were like, here comes the king. And then I think you had some people that were probably like, here comes the king. Kind of, kind of like confused. They, they weren't really celebrating. They were more confused. Here, here comes the king. I, I don't, I don't see a king because in, in that time, Rome was occupying Jerusalem, and Tiberius Caesar was the, the emperor of Rome, and really kind of the emperor of the world. He had conquered a lot of the world. His father, Augustus Caesar, or Caesar Augustus, had conquered a lot of the world. That's the king. Like, when, when they think king, I know we're in church, so when we say, here comes the king, you're like, oh yeah, Jesus, I love Jesus, King Jesus. But that's not what they would have thought. If you were just a passerby and you heard, here comes the king, you would be like, I didn't know Caesar was in town. This is, this is, this is Bethany and Bethpage. Why, why is Caesar here? I thought he was in Rome. Oh, here comes the king. And then you probably have a third group of people who had maybe heard about Jesus or heard about the followers of Jesus, and their thing was kind of like, here comes the king. <laughs> Here, here, oh yeah, sure. This is the king, right? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna get yeah. You little followers of Jesus. Okay, you, you're so cute. You, you ever met anybody like that? Oh, you go to church? Well, that's cute. Isn't that just infuriating? When somebody says like, "Man, that's cute," I'm like, "That is the worst thing you could say to me." Like, I, I do not. That's so demeaning to me. But I think they were like, "Here comes the king," and in our lives when. We are following after Jesus, and when we're going into something new in our life, and we're stepping into our purpose, and when we're stepping into our calling, we meet those same people along the road. You'll meet the people like, wow, that's amazing, you're going back to school, come on. And then they're like, you're going back to school? And the other people are like, I remember how that worked out last time, you're going back to school? Come on, you're, you're going to start a business? Wow, come on, that's amazing! You're... You're starting, a, you're starting a business, yeah, you're going to start a business, sure, sure. So when we say, here comes the king, there were a lot of different reactions. There were a lot of different ways that you can approach this. And we see those same people, whether we say, God's going to heal me. People are like, yes, God's going to heal you. I'm praying with you. Come on, let's pray right now. God's going to heal you? And the people are like, God's not going to heal you. Because... God didn't heal me, or God didn't come through when I wanted it. And so we have these people that celebrate. They're kind of messengers of Jesus. We have people that are in the middle and people that mock us. And so what do we do when we're stepping into such an important moment, just like Jesus was stepping into these final moments of his life, the final week of his life, and the crowd was not really supportive. The crowd was not really following with him. The Pharisees were even saying, you need to calm your people down, because the Pharisees were scared of the Romans. Let me just give you a little context here. This, there were a lot of people in Jerusalem at this time because the Passover feast is happening this week. And so Jerusalem would swell like 10x its population because you had so many people coming in to celebrate the Passover feast. And every couple of years you would have someone come in and try to cause an insurrection. So you would have someone try to overthrow the Romans because no one that was a, a Jew liked the Romans being there. They just kind of had to deal with them. And, and so they were wanting to overthrow the Romans. They didn't want Tiberius Caesar to be their conqueror anymore, but they were also scared of the Romans. So they were like, Jesus, we don't want you to cause too much of a stir. We don't want you to cause too much of a commotion because then we're going to get in trouble. Then we're going to be scared, and, and we're really scared of the Romans. <laughs> and the Romans, I, I just I, I noticed this as I was reading, the Romans think so little of Jesus, they don't even care. 
Like if, if they would thought he was a threat, maybe they would have sent some soldiers. Maybe they would have sent some people that are like, man, we're going we're gonna to keep some people around this guy. But that's how little they thought of what Jesus was doing. The king of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the alpha and omega, that in the beginning he was, ah, we're not really worried about him. It's just a guy on a donkey. And so I just begin to read this and I begin to think about what were Jesus' thoughts in that moment because Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully human. The Bible says that he was tempted in all ways that are common unto man. So I just want to encourage you in this place, if you've been dealing with some temptation, Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. Even though he never sinned, even though he was a spotless lamb, a sacrifice for all of us, Jesus knows what you're going through. So never go into prayer feeling like I'm so ashamed, I'm so dirty, God's never going to understand. No, Jesus knows exactly what you're going through, what you've been through. And, and I can imagine the temptation in that moment to let the crowd affect his calling. Am I going to let the crowd and what they think about me affect what I am called to do? Because Jesus had been sent to this earth, yes, to heal people, yes, to raise people from the dead, yes, to preach the message of the kingdom. But ultimately, the reason that Jesus came down to the earth, the reason that God of the universe wrapped himself in humanity, the reason he came is to go to a cross. But not just to go to a cross, but to go three days later in a grave, resurrect for all of humanity, to ascend into heaven, to send us the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus came. But what if the crowd would have swayed him in his calling? What if they would have swayed him? And I just want to encourage you that Jesus wasn't trying to impress people. He was trying to save people. Jesus didn't come to impress people. He didn't come to make a name known for himself. In fact, oftentimes throughout the Gospels, whenever Jesus began to get a crowd, he would send them away. Whenever Jesus started to get a lot of followers, he would tell them like something like, hey, make sure you pick up your cross and that you're willing to die with me. Oh, you're not? Well, you can go away. Jesus was, was almost anti-getting a crowd. He would just disappear. Come on, anybody in here, probably the introverts, when you're in a big crowded room, you just disappear. And everybody's like, where'd John go? I don't know. I think he left like two hours ago. He just took his keys. He rode out. That's kind of how Jesus was. It said that he would withdraw to lonely places. He wasn't trying to get the crowd. He wasn't trying to impress the crowd. He was trying to save humanity. It wasn't about just getting a few people to celebrate and a few people to cheer for him. No, it was about saving humanity, even though he was going to save them in a way that they didn't expect. Don't you just love when Jesus does things the way you don't expect? That was being sarcastic because no one loves that. If you just, if you just nodded, I'm, yeah, you might have just lied in church. I just love when Jesus does things that I don't like. <laughs> because they were expecting a king, a warring king, to come in and to conquer and to kick out the Romans. And so when they were saying Hosanna, a lot of times in church we sing that, you know, Hosanna, you know, it's just so beautiful. But really what that means is save us now. <laughs> There's a little em emphasis on that. Save us right now. And Jesus, the way that you're coming into this situation doesn't look like you have the power to save us. Have you ever felt like that before? God, I don't know if you have the power to deliver me from what I'm going through right now. I don't know if you have the power to heal me of what I'm experiencing right now. I don't know if you have the power. I know you saved me in the past. I know you took us out of Egypt. I know you took us across the Jordan River. I know you did all those things. But I don't know if Jesus on the donkey is quite powerful enough to save us from the Roman Empire. But again, he wasn't coming to save them from the Roman Empire. He was coming to save them from their sin. So the power wasn't about taking over by force and by might. It was about going to the cross. And so he wasn't looking to impress them. Jesus was more concerned with his assignment than their acceptance. He was more concerned with his assignment than the crowd's acceptance. He wasn't trying to impress people because people will change on you. See, this is what you have to know, and I, I love leadership. I know we're in church, but as a leader, you can't always be concerned about people liking you because the people you are leading, sometimes you have to do things that they don't like, but it's good for them. 
I've heard it said, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but I've heard it said that you can't lead someone when you need them. Because if you need them, their opinions, their actions are going to change the way that you lead. And so he wasn't trying to impress them because in this moment they were saying, Hosanna. They were saying, King. They were saying, the king is here, here comes the king. And then a week later, the same people would be saying, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas. Barabbas was a prisoner, he was literally a domestic terrorist. And they said, we would rather have Barabbas over Jesus. So the crowd will turn on you. You can't live in your calling if the crowd likes you or if they don't like you, you can't be swayed by what the crowd is doing. You can't let people's opinions dictate your obedience. I'm going to say that one more time. You can't let people's opinions dictate your obedience. Because the world we live in today, I'm just going to be honest, there are a lot of things that Jesus is commanding us to do that are not going to make people happy. It's not going to get people on our side. But are we going to let their opinions dictate whether we obey the Word of God or not? whether we obey where God is sending us. So he wasn't concerned about them accepting him, and not everyone's going to accept you. When you're stepping into what God has called you to do, when you're stepping into your purpose, when you're stepping into your destiny, and maybe there will be multiple points in your life where this happens, you're going to have some people that are praising you, some people that are celebrating you, other people that are mocking you. But you can't let that dictate your obedience, because again, those same people can turn on you. It wasn't about their acceptance, it was about Him saving them. See, God doesn't always give us what we want, but He always gives us what we need. He doesn't always give us what we want, but He always gives us what we need. Because what what they wanted was a king to come in on a white horse with a chariot and an army, and they wanted him to go to battle in Jerusalem and kick out all the Romans and then go from there to Rome and kick out. They, they wanted a, a savior to come in and to conquer the, the, the city, to conquer the area. But Jesus said, no, I'm coming in to conquer death, hell, and the grave. I'm coming in to conquer something that is bigger than just this moment right here. Because, yes, he could have done what they wanted 2,000-ish years ago, and it would have made them super happy. But what about us now? He said, I'm trying to conquer a kingdom and establish a kingdom that's going to last for all of eternity. That 2,000-ish years later, there's going to be people remembering this moment. This is one of the incredible proofs of Christianity to me because there were a lot of people who tried to raise up an army and who even said that they were the Messiah, but we don't remember any of them. But most of the places that you go in the world, most people at least have somewhat of an idea or at least have heard of Jesus. So if Jesus was just another guy that was pretending to be a savior, why did we forget everyone else but we remember Jesus? Why did all the followers abandon all those other guys, but 2,000 years later there are people today, right now, all around the world proclaiming the name of Jesus? It's amazing to me. It's a proof to me that Jesus is different than the other people that said they were messiahs, that they were saviors. So God may not always give you what you want, but he always gives you what you need. I know there's a lot of times in my life where I've written down in my prayer journal, come on, I've had my vision board. I, I, I prayed, God, this is, I know this is how you're going to do it. It just makes sense to me. I've got it all figured out. <laughs> and then it don't happen. <laughs> and I'm like, God, what happened? I thought it was going to work out. But, but isn't, it, isn't it silly for us to think that we in our, in our finite understanding, in our limited time here on earth, that we have it more figured out than the God of the universe, that the Bible says he knows the beginning to the, the end from the beginning, that he knows all time, that he knows the very hair on your head. Come on, I think he knows a little bit more than us. And so he may not do it the way we wanted, but he does it the way we need. And this is where faith comes into our life, that faith isn't always believing that things are going to work out exactly in the way that makes sense. Because why would we need faith? Like if we can put it down on a piece of paper, if if it just makes sense, if it all comes together, there's no need for faith. But faith is when I say and when I believe something that is different from what I see. See, what I see in my life right now is that I got a 
250 credit score, <laughs> and I got a red negative bank account, but God's called me to be a kingdom business owner. So I got to have faith even when I can't see it. I, I, I have faith that one day I'm going to be married, and I'm speaking for other people. I'm already married, okay, just to throw that out there. But, but I have faith that one day I'm going to be married, and one day I'm going to have children, but, but every relationship I have has been toxic and abusive. I, I, I've got to speak it, and I've got to believe it, even when what is around me doesn't seem to make sense. I speak it even when I don't see it. And so I believe that Jesus is king even when he's riding on a donkey, even when he doesn't have an army, even when this doesn't make sense to me in the natural, there's something in my spirit that attaches and says, no, I'm going to believe it even when I don't see it. So he was concerned with his assignment, his assignment of the cross more than the crowd's acceptance. And the next thing that he was concerned with is Jesus was more concerned with the anointing over appearance. He was concerned with the anointing over appearance. And if you're new to church, you're like, what does that even mean, anointing? That's kind of a churchy word. In a simple understanding, anointing is when God's favor comes upon someone. When God blesses someone, in the Old Testament especially, when a new king was being crowned, the prophet of God would come and would pour oil on top of the king's head. And this was symbolic of now this king has been blessed by God to lead this nation. And it's interesting that even though we don't see a priest in this passage, even though we don't see Jesus coming in and having oil poured all over him, it says that he's going down the Mount of Olives. Where do you get oil from? The olives. And so as he's going down the road of the Mount of Olives, it is symbolic that God is anointing him in this moment. That this is the anointing, that this is the coronation ceremony. Even though we don't have a priest, the pope isn't around, we don't have the trumpet players, we don't have the gold, the anointing matters more than the appearance. Because the appearance is he's on a donkey, and he doesn't have an army, and he doesn't have money, and he's got dusty sandals on. Like, that's the appearance. But the anointing matters more than the appearance. Let me encourage you that the anointing is more important in your life than anything that you can do on the outside. Because there are people that can look the look, they can talk the talk, they know all the churchy words, they know all the, the, the slang, they know all the stuff, but they have no power because they have no anointing. And then, pro and you can probably see this in your life, the people that you would be so unassuming that you would, you would, man, I don't even, I don't even, I've never even recognized them before. They just blend in, can be some of the most anointed people that you have ever met in your life. Because the anointing doesn't always line up with the appearance. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, many of you heard of a guy named David. Anybody heard of him? Just a little figure in the Bible. The prophet Samuel goes to David's home ready to anoint a king. And Samuel does what all of us would do. He says, where's the biggest? Where's the strongest? Where's the best looking? That's who's going to be king. So they start with the brothers. There's all these brothers. And he's like, okay, the firstborn. Come on, he's the firstborn. He's big. He's bad. That's going to be king. And God's like, nope. <laughs> he's like, okay, number two. You know, if you ain't first, you're last. But we're going to go to number two. And God's like, no. They work their way all the way down through all the brothers. And Samuel says, do you have any other sons, Jesse? Because God sent me here, but he said none of these are it. And Jesse, David was so lowly that he didn't even, Jesse didn't even invite him in. Like, th th this would be equivalent to having a dignitary come to your home. This would be like the most famous person you can think of. Th think about the, the preacher that you look up to the highest in the world. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's Pastor Michael. Maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe it's T.D. Jakes. Maybe it's Stephen Furtick. Whoever it is, imagine them coming to your house. Like, th this was a, a famous guy, and David didn't even get an invite. And it's at his own house. Some people, some theologians believe that this was because David was an illegitimate son of Jesse. Mm. Don't think that God can't use your mistakes. Don't think that just because something is illegitimate in man's eyes that God can't turn it legitimate and use it for his glory. What the enemy meant for evil, God can turn it around for his good. Come on, how many of you know that all things work together for those that love God and are called according to his purpose? Don't ever call something illegitimate. They called Jesus illegitimate, and look what he did. 
So David comes and Samuel anoints David and, and God tells Samuel in, in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, don't judge by his appearance or his height. The Lord doesn't see the things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Don't confuse people's anointing and their appearance because something can look right, it can feel right and not be right. I, I, I'm, I'm not a big uh, sneaker person. I'm more of a Wrangler person than a Jordan person. I think Pastor Michael is more of a sneakerhead than me, but StockX, which is a really large marketplace for sneakers, uh, those ones that cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars, even thousands of dollars, is right now being sued by Nike because StockX for a long time was seen as this place where you can buy shoes and you know that they're authentic. You know that they're the real shoe from the, from the actual factory. It's not one of these replicas, but they've been letting more and more fakes get through their website, and they're putting the seal, the StockX seal, it's this little green tag, and it's like the end-all, be-all. If you have that tag, it's legitimate, but <laughs> it's not. <laughs> and they've been sending out these shoes that they put the stamp of approval on, but they aren't legitimate. They look legitimate, but they're not legitimate. And so Nike is now suing StockX because they've been saying something is legitimate because it looks right in their eyes. But the creator, mm, the manufacturer, Nike says that didn't come from us. That didn't, we didn't put our name on that. We didn't put our seal on that. Come on, somebody may look at you and you may not have the look. You may not have the verbiage. You may not have the lineage or the history. Maybe you got saved last week. That doesn't matter because if the manufacturer, if God Almighty puts his stamp of approval on you, it doesn't matter if anybody else approves of you or not because man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Come on, anybody thankful that Jesus approves of us? Even when we make mistakes, even when we mess up, he approves of us. So don't think that things are just because something doesn't look legit, that it's not. Because the Jews missed the Messiah because he didn't look the way that they thought he would look. Even though there had been prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, even in Zechariah, Zechariah 9, 9, I think we have the scripture, if you can throw it up there real quick, I don't have it in my notes. Zechariah, hundreds of years before, told them that there was going to be a donkey. Shout for triumph, O people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you, he's righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey is colt. Even though they'd heard the prophecies, because it didn't look the way they wanted it to look, they missed out on the Messiah. And they ended up crucifying the very one who had been sent to save them. So don't get confused with how something looks and miss the blessing that God is trying to send into your life. Don't say that just because it doesn't look the way I want and the way that I imagine, this must not be what God has for me. There's no way God could bless this thing. There's no way God could bless that job. I would never work in that industry. I would never work with those people. I would never go to that side of town. No, there's no way God could use that. It's almost as if every time in the Bible, the person that God used was the one that everyone said couldn't be used. The one that everyone said wasn't good enough, wasn't strong enough, wasn't brave enough, didn't come from the right family. That's the type of people that God is looking for because God loves to do things that don't make sense to us because when he does it and everybody comes up to you and they're like, how in the world? Like, I don't want to offend you, but how did you do that? I mean, I love you, but you're not that smart. You, 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 this is how I feel like when me and Hannah got married, people were like, you're not that good looking, okay? You don't have that much money. <laughs> I was like, it's the Lord, it's the Lord. But come on, that's the way that God loves to do things. It's so that when people come into your life, there's no way that you can get the glory. There's no way that you can get the credit. All you can do is say, I know it doesn't look the way that it should look. I know it doesn't sound
sound the way it should sound, but God has anointed me for this. God has put a blessing on my life. God has put a favor on my life and I can't take credit for it. I can just give you credit. I can give credit to the King. Here comes the King. Why don't you stand with me? We're about to close. The anointing is what authenticates you. The anointing is what authenticates you. See, be careful not to get frustrated at God because it doesn't look the way you thought it would look. Don't get disappointed when it's different. Don't get disappointed when your relationship looks different. Don't get disappointed when your financial situation looks different. Don't get don't get disappointed when your job looks different because you don't know what God is trying to set you up for. You don't know what God is trying to do in your life. And here's the thing, we, we won't know. I think that's what can be frustrating sometimes about our faith is that as soon as you know it, God's gonna change something and then you're gonna have to trust them again. Then you're gonna have to take another step of faith. <laughs> Because this, again, the same people that are shouting, Jesus, here comes the King. Jesus goes into the grave. And for those three days, they had a lot of contemplation to do. There were a lot of people that were following Jesus up to that point, but they're like, Jesus, um, I know you said you were gonna go to the cross, but, but we didn't really think you was gonna go to the cross. <laughs> We didn't really think you were actually going to die, that you were actually going to go in the grave, that you were actually going to stay in there. I didn't, God, I know you, I know that you say, you know, like pick up your cross and follow you. I know that you say, you know, in the kingdom of God, that the way up is down and that we have to be lowly and serve. But I didn't actually think that I was going to get a demotion. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't actually think I was going to have to put my actions where my words were. I didn't actually think I was gonna have to live out my faith. I, I thought I was just gonna come to church and that was gonna be like, God's gonna bless me and this is gonna be great and this is gonna be amazing. I didn't think I was actually gonna have to live it when I get to, when I get to school on Monday. That I was actually gonna have to live it when I get to work on Monday. There, there, there's a song that I love right now. It's called a Monday kind of faith. I think that's what we need. We need a Monday kind of faith that when God shows up and it doesn't look the way we thought and it doesn't feel the way that we thought and it doesn't smell the way that we thought, that we don't act on what we see, we act on what we believe. That we say what the Word of God says, not what we see with our eyes. We say what we see in our spirit. And so right now, I just wanna encourage you and our prayer team's gonna come forward one more time. But I wanna encourage you that yes, Jesus came 2,000-ish years ago and he came on Palm Sunday and make sure you come back next week on Easter. Make sure you invite everybody you know. I'm sure they've given you resources, posts on your social media, do invite cards, stop by somebody's house, bang on there, bribe them, tell them you'll get them coffee, tell them there's some single people here at church, whatever you gotta do to get people here for Easter. So I, I don't wanna, I don't, I wanna preach Pastor Michael's sermon, I don't want to get into Easter, but I do want to encourage you that just as Jesus came riding on a donkey, just as we look at each other and say, here comes the King, in this moment, I want to let you know that Jesus wants to come into your situation. Just as he was riding into Bethany and Bethpage, just as he was coming into Jerusalem, Jesus wants to come in and he wants to meet you exactly where you are. And maybe you're one of those people that are like, I love Jesus, I'm good, I believe this, and I'm so thankful for that. Come on, we, we encourage that, we love that, keep going. Maybe you're one of those people that you're here today, but you're like, I don't really know about all this. I, I don't really know if Jesus is gonna come into my life or not. I, I don't really know if he's working in my life or not. He feels absent right now. He feels distant right now. I, I wanna just encourage you, I wanna look at you. Here comes the king, not a far off king, not a story, not a book that was written thousands of years ago. No, in this moment, Jesus is coming just for you. That's what I love about the gospel, that if it was just one person, Jesus would have still gone to the cross. A lot of times we think he died for someone else. He died for my grandma that always prayed and read the Bible. He, he died for my friend at work that's always talking about God. He didn't die about me, no, no. If it was just you, he would have come for you. The King would have come for you. And same for those of you in here and 
Maybe you came today and you, you don't believe any of this. And you're like, why is this guy up there yelling at me? And I don't even know who this is. And my parents made me come today or my girlfriend made me come or my husband made me come. And you're like, I don't know about any of this. What I, I just encourage you, what if you just gave it a chance? What if you just said, maybe this is the King of Kings. We've been waiting all these years. They'd been waiting for a Messiah for hundreds of years. Maybe you've been waiting for an answer to your anxiety for years. You've been waiting for a miracle in your body for years. You've been waiting for something to restore your marriage that you've been separated from your spouse. You've been waiting for years. What if this is the opportunity? So don't miss it just because it looks different. Don't miss it because maybe it's not your style. Maybe I yell a little bit too much. Maybe I'm not smart enough for you, but don't miss what God is trying to do in this moment. And so as our prayer team comes forward, I want every eye to close and every head to bow. And I'm gonna pray a general prayer over you. We're gonna go into a song of worship. And during that song, if you want Jesus to come into your situation, I wanna invite you to come forward. But dear Lord, we just lift up the name of Jesus. God, we declare that you are King of Kings. You are Lord of Lords. You are Alpha. You are Omega. That no matter what the world says about you, no matter what the crowd says about you, that God, you are King. You are Lord of our life. You are Savior, that you are for us and not against us. We praise you, we worship you, and we say that you are King Jesus. Come on, can you make some noise for King Jesus as we worship in this place? Oh, come on, get crazy. Get crazy. Come on, King Jesus. Hey, I love you. God bless you. Let's worship. Come on, let's encounter God right now.